welcome everyone to today's presentation. Um, and it's our final town hall for 2023. Um, uh, you know, we've run a couple of these. Um, we've also run the symposium. So, um, you know, it's been a great year uh, and there's so much changing and there's some great things that we want to share with you today. Uh, and I've been able to pull together some fantastic um, presenters um, from the Fusion 5 team to talk to you today about a few different bits and pieces. So um, the main thing with these is, um, you know, questions are important to us. Questions are important to me in regards to this. Uh, so everyone has the ability to throw your questions into the chat. Um, so put your questions into the, into the questions area. Um, if we have a chance at the end of each presentation and there's relevant questions to that, um, I'll get the presenter, I'll work through those with the presenter. Any questions that we don't get to during that, we do have the Q&A section at the end um, where I'll bring the whole panel back online uh, and we'll go through those. And if we do by chance happen to run out of time um, with any and there's any questions left over, um, I will take note of those and we'll reach out directly to you uh, and get your response to your questions. So with that, just a little bit about um, you know, the agenda for today's town hall. Uh, I'll do a little bit of an introduction, talk about a few things um, that are happening and do a little, re little bit of a recap of, um, you know, what we've spoken about at our events for 2023, just to get people thinking about them again as we head to close out this year and look at, you know, jumping into 2024. Uh, you know, we've got the main body of today's presentation, which is, you know, the top five from Fusion 5, um, where I've got Vanessa Shree, Justin Struan and Shannon uh, talking to you about uh, a variety of different things that um, you know we've focused on and worked with customers over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, once that's done, Shannon's going to talk about the latest updates from InFocus and Jay Edwards. So we had both Shannon and Glenn uh, jump over to Denver for the annual JDE conference um, that was held there. Uh, so we've got the latest information about what's going on and the, and the team is going to share that with you. We'll then, yeah, open it up to Q&A. If we get through all the questions, um, I will unmute everyone, so give people to ask questions directly. Um, and so really um, appreciate interaction and take the opportunity while you've got the seven of us on the, um, the six of us on the call to ask any questions that you want to uh, find out more information. Um, and then I'll just do a little wrap up. I've got a couple of things. We've got a potential deals. Um, and then also, you know, some planning for 2024, particularly looking at um, locking in people's date, the date in people's calendar for uh, the symposium for next year, which is always, a, uh, you know, a massive event. We're able to go back to in person this year. So look forward to running it again next year. Uh, with that, you know, the goal of all these sessions, um, whether it is the town halls that we're running, whether it is our symposium, whether it's in any of our other, um, you know, uh, education sessions that we run, you know, we are here to work with you. We are here to partner you. We are here to support you. And we're also here to provide you with knowledge so you can have, uh, make more informed decisions and innovate and introduce an innovation culture into your organization, um, linking with JD Edwards. So that's always been our focus. It's, you know, this is about knowledge sharing and, um, you know, talking to you, whether it's customers talking to you or whether it's the team talking to you about actual things and how you can do stuff uh, with your JDWoods application. You know, that is the goal and that is the focus of these. Also, we're looking at, you know, how can you, you know, reduce your costs um, and also increase your efficiency and quality. Um, so, you know, it's that standard of how can I, how can I increase my ROI and decrease my total cost, cost of ownership? So, you know, what can I do with what I've already got? What can I do with, you know, am I utilizing licensing? And we find this with a lot of customers. Am I, are we using our license, all our licensing that we've already got? There's many customers out there that are licensed for many modules that then they're only just scratching the surface or they're not even using it all. So with all that information, just wanted to do a little recap about, you know, what have we talked about and what we've presented in sessions uh, this year, because I think they're relevant and they'll continue to be relevant as we go through 2024, 2025, 2026 and on. So, you know, what is, what is vanilla? 
what is the level of vanilla? Where can I go and how vanilla can I become? You know, with my JD Woods instance, we're always talking about that. Whether you're on 9.2, whether you need to get to 9.2, or whether you're a person that's on 9.2 and have started the continuous delivery, it's always about can, how can I reduce that technical debt? What can I take out? What can I de-customize? What can I de-risk in terms of my solution? Everyone can, whether you can get to that full vanilla, you know, that's a question. Um, you know, for some customers, they've done that. Um, it takes time, it takes money, it takes large organisational change management. However, it is possible, but it should be a focus of everyone is to find out what is my level of vanilla. And we ran run through that and we have lots of offerings and lots of ways um, that to enable people to get to there. The next thing we spoke about was, you know, was it one of our main themes of the symposium was the dirty surround strategy. Yes, everyone has this little world of Gaddy Woods in the centre. Um, but we know that, you know, Gaddy Woods, you know, can't do everything. You know, support has been pushed out. Yes, they have the local team to do that. You know, people are doing cloud journeys. There's a lot of people who move, whether it's OCI, Azure, AWS, whatever. Um, there are still a lot of people that haven't started a cloud journey or there's potential risk. Um, and based on geographic location, compliance, security, whatever, um, from the reasons that they, you know, they haven't been able to start that journey. Um, you know, we spoke about, um, you know, what can you do, um, you know, linking with it. Um, there's all these bits that connect to it, whether it's, you know, security, reporting, training, transformation. I spoke really about OCM, so organised and change management. And then there's also, you know, managed services, enterprise cloud, security, things like that. So it's all these little bits that go with it. JD Woods made massive improvements in terms of integration. Um, we've done multiple sessions and there's multiple, there's lots of information out there about orchestration and we'll talk a little bit about it again. Um, but, you know, it's that mindset now that you can connect anything to anything. Um, it's very simplified, the process. And if you go and have a look at um, you know, particularly what Shannon spoke about with his keynote. Um, there's some great things which then links into the evolution of process automation to enterprise automation, you know, um, and, and going on from there. Shannon did some great things about talking about AI uh, and, you know, and chat GPT and things like that. So JD Woods is the digital platform, everyone. It is going on a digital journey. It is a major focus for Oracle with this solution. Um, they're pushing innovation, we're leading innovation as Fusion 5. So, um, you know, it's if you're looking at things to do, and today is a prime example, we'll go through five specific examples of innovation and how you can take it, um, your JD Woods to the next level. We also know that everyone's on a journey of some form with JD Woods. Um, so we'll not say that you must go this way, you must do this. We'll find the options and then give you a recommendation based on your journey or where we think you can go and where you should go. Um, and then at the end, have a think through this, and it was a key thing with all our presentations, um, find somewhere to start or how to embrace the journey you need to go on. Um, look at uh, a specific pain point, get that working proof of concept, you know, just get the process going. Don't try and throw out the big bang. Um, outside of that, you know, we also talked on a pile of little things, other things this year. So we've run through all that, um, you know, particularly the waves of innovation, AI, machine learning, GPT. It's big, um, you know, cloud hosting, um, I spoke about it, but I think it's, the, it's there for everyone to embrace. Um, and we can talk through all your options for you and um, give you recommendations based on if you've started a cloud journey somewhere else inside the organisation, how you can expand that to take JD Woods, or if you haven't, we can table all the options for you. Um, business transformation, we spoke about process automation. A big thing was around data wrangling um, and data analysis, you know, really trying to introduce that trust in your data. Um, security, um, whether that's from the start, so your binary to the browser and the app, you know, um, so whether it's inside your infrastructure to what you need to do for your application and your reporting, um, we're always talking about integration and we're always talking about, you know, how you can improve the user experience. Um, there's large 
sections of JD Woods' content out there, whether it's on Learn JDE or things that we talk, it's always about improving the usability and improving the user experience. And it's a large thing that is part and parcel of 9.2. Okay, last little bit. So, top five confusion five. Where did this come about? How are we going into? And then we'll jump into the, the bits and pieces here. So, really, we're trying to think about you know, one of the feedbacks, one of the main feedback that we get from cut from any of our sessions is talking about real life examples, talking about what customers are doing. So what I did was I put a survey out to our team and, you know, we're talking 50, 60 consultants across Australia and New Zealand. And when, you know, what, what are the key things that you're talking to customers? What are the key things that you're working with customers? And we took all the feedback on board and then we took the top five and then we looked at real life examples of what's going on and what customers have done. So that's where that's this all come about. Um, so this is the top five from Fusion 5 or things that we have done with customers in the last 12 to 18 months um, to help enhance their solution and improve business processes. Okay, with that, I want to do is I want to jump across to the first session um, and this is talking about maturity assessments with one of our lead functional consultants, Vanessa Mills. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning everybody. Today I'm going to speak about maturity models and in particular the Fusion 5 maturity model for JDE applications. Fusion 5 has developed this maturity model um, with the experience of the JDE consultants who have consulted to multiple businesses and have witnessed what does work and what doesn't work within the JDE environment. The maturity model has multiple levels that represent different degrees of maturity. Our levels are basic use, efficient, best in class and transformative. In each level, we have key practices or application use that set the maturity level. An assessment is conducted to determine the maturity level that the organization being reviewed is at, and then a plan is created with actionable items that help move the organization along the maturity continuum. An example in the financial stream would be that a business uses simple accounts receivable just the invoicing and the cash receipting applications, and therefore would have a starting maturity level of basic use. By implementing credit management, the organization would move to the efficient maturity level. There are several reasons why a maturity model assessment may be good for a business. One is that businesses and business processes evolve over the years but these changes are not reflected in the use of JDE. Or it may be to optimize the benefits of a JDE tools or applications upgrade. In the maturity model evaluation process, we use workshops and data analytics reviews to gather data. The workshops are conducted with key business units to determine how they use the JDE module and these workshops allow us to understand the business processes and the pain points experienced by the users. We also endeavor to gain an insight into what improvements the users actually want. We use ERP insights for data analytics, where we review what programs within the modules are being used and what programs are not being used. Often it is these programs not being used that give the most benefit. The ERP Insight Review also shows the data volume and transaction types used and the length of time each job takes. The most used applications allow us to focus on the parts of the business that are consuming the user's time. The deliverables from a, from a maturity model assessment is a document showing the maturity scoring and the actions that can be taken to improve the maturity of the business. Here is an example of that scoring showing the current maturity level of basic use 
for procurement, price management and inventory and warehousing and efficient use for reporting. And then also the potential maturity scoring for each of those areas once the action plan has been implemented. Some examples of recommendations from maturity models that we have conducted. Make the user experience better by using more UDOs. If you set up composite and E1 pages, this gives the users a landing page that allows them to easily access their tasks and reduce the number of clicks that they need to get into applications. Use form extensions. By adding additional important information that isn't on a standard JDE screen to the screen that the users use, it means that they don't have to go into another application to review that additional piece of data. Create watch lists. Watch lists highlight um, for the user if there are issues in the data. Uh, use new applications. In, in the example I, I, I gave you, just implement um, credit management in accounts receivable. Or um, in, in financials, there are two new workflows. One to approve changes in the bank account details. These workflows now send emails to the approver so that you don't have to rely on the approver to go into the pay control to see if there have been changes in bank accounts. And there's a, also another new workflow that allows you to approve accounts payable vouchers that have not been created via the purchasing system. Um, during the maturity model assessment, we review the business processes. And um, here are two examples, one from a manufacturing maturity model assessment and one from a financial maturity model assessment that we conducted. Um, in the manufacturing maturity model assessment, the review revealed that the work order creation and work order attachments were being excessively used. The analysis of the business process revealed that the users were using it to create replenishment orders. The recommendation was that a simple Kanban process be implemented. This process automated the creation of the works order and automatically attached the part list, allowing the users to spend less time on the computer and increase the accuracy of the capture. In the financial maturity model assessment, we reviewed the process of raising manual accounts receivable invoices. These were for rent, where this was not the core business of the organization. The recommendation was that recurring invoices be implemented, which allowed the users to run a UBE to recur the invoices at month end, instead of spending two hours capturing these invoices. Typically, a maturity model engagement looks something like this. The business chooses the module or group of modules that need to be reviewed, and then they try to determine where on the maturity continuum they would like to be. We then undertake the database analysis of the module and see what is used and what is not used and we hold workshops with the key users to identify the business processes and the pain points. We then document the gaps and opportunities and determine how the gaps will be closed by providing actionable steps to improve the maturity level. So any JDE implementation may benefit from a maturity model assessment. We view this as an iterative process. A module is selected and reviewed, then the planned actions completed and the process can be repeated until the required level of maturity has been achieved. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so with that, um, you know, continuing our trend, doing a slightly different front. Um, so going more from a you know from the, the functional world to now jumping into a little bit around um, you know, some development 
um, and integration and I'd like to bring on board uh, Justin Sims, who's one of our lead developers, but also from an integration architect perspective. Thanks for that, Andrew. Uh, today, I'll be talking about our dynamic filtering uh, solution we've implemented at several of our clients in the last 12 to 18 months. So as hopefully everyone is well aware by now, there's been a paradigm shift in how JD integrates to other systems. This shift has both been enabled and led by the introduction and the widespread adoption of the orchestrator. In brief, this has meant that JD integrations can now be designed around modern API architected solutions, allowing us to present JD functionality to the wider world in the form of REST APIs, significantly simplifying the use of real of true real-time integrations. And it has allowed transaction-based integrations, which when extended by the likes of the Fusion 5 integration framework, provides users JD native logging and error trapping of individual requests. But in most cases, the focus, the emphasis has been on extending JD functionality out to other systems, allowing other systems to integrate into JDE. From a JD perspective, the focus has been on inbound transactions. When considering outbound transactions, the depth of functionality within JDE, functionality that customers rely on each and every day, produces a huge number of events, processes, and activities that could potentially be of interest to external systems. The creation of a sales order, a customer being put on hold, an item being made obsolete or reclassified, et cetera, et cetera. The list is extremely long. For the purposes of this presentation, we will use sales as our example. Sales is a widely used system in the JD space and is so often at the forefront of integration requirements. It's an area where we see many clients having integration opportunities, especially as its processes are often intertwined with other systems, be they WMS systems, e-commerce, or even other ERPs. Given the complexity of JD systems and the high number of potential events, capturing all of them in a clean and efficient manner can present a significant challenge. At Fusion 5, we've developed a low-touch method that we've extended out to key systems, including sales, to capture changes or events as they happen anywhere in real time. Use of the Fusion 5 method is not a requirement for what we will be discussing. Any method that can capture events with the same efficacy, accuracy, and reliability could potentially be used. Back to the sales order. As I'm sure everyone here knows, during the normal sales order life cycle, there are a lot of process points or events that can happen. Additionally, there are a lot of events that can happen outside of the normal cycle. But once we are capturing all of these events, all of this fantastically useful information, there are many, many systems with many use cases that could make use of them. This is all perfectly okay and normal, but without some form of control, the number of transactions can very quickly become an issue. Very soon, you end up with too much information, lots of chatter, lots of noise. Now, this can be resolved pretty quickly by building static rules into the extraction mechanism, which is great at solving the requirements as they exist at the time they are developed. However, as soon as something changes, and it could be any number of things, a need for a previously unrequired process step or a new order type that needs to be included or excluded. It could be almost anything. Then technical ex expertise is usually required, introducing risk and as always, cost. As mentioned in the previous slide, the more common static filtering process is usually a set of rigid rules with little or no flexibility. Fusion 5 have developed a system that will perform the role of filtering the events as required by the business. The rules that perform this filtering are not hard-coded but dynamic. These filtering rules are client-defined and are used to include or exclude events. And as well as determining if an action is to be taken, the system allows for configuration of the action itself, defining the process, request specifics, and timing of how the orchestration will be called. Based on this filter and action setup, the dynamic filtering process then invokes the requested action or actions. And the configuration of the setup, P 
the ability to add rules, modify rules, delete rules, or even just temporarily disable rules is available to the appropriate users without the need for any technical involvement. It is all done from JDE using JDE entry screens. This is an example of a JDE application used to configure dynamic filters for a sales order based integrations process. Keep in mind the specifics of the filters and exactly how the screen looks would vary by client. While we see many common filter requirements across clients, there are usually differences in process or setup, which lead to subtle changes in how the dynamic filters are designed and how these screens look. But nonetheless, the basic principles remain the same. The filter definitions are obviously a vital part of these records and broadly fall into two primary groups, direct and indirect. The first type of filter check is what we call direct filters. With direct filters, if an event meets the criteria specified, then no further checking is done. The event is either excluded or included immediately. An example of this would be an integration that applies to everything except credit orders. In this case, the credit order type is added as an exclusion and none of the other criteria will even be looked at. Exclusion is a more common use case for direct filters but direct inclusions are not unknown. Next, we have group filters. With these filters, all criteria must be satisfied for an event to be actioned. In the case of sales, these filters can be set at either header or detail level, as shown here. As shown here. But the case remains the same. All group criteria, header and detail, must be met before the event will be actioned. And note that we allow an asterisk as a skip or include all condition. It is used to indicate that this condition is assumed to be met in all cases. Some integrations need to be called only for specific branches, for example, whereas some will be called for all branches, just as an example. The special filters are used to capture any specialized filtering needs particular to an individual client. When used, these tend to be very narrow targeted or custom requirements. Just as important as the filters are the action definitions. These are used to, to determine what to do. These tell the system the orchestration to be called. This is the actual orchestration name for the process to call and is validated on entry to ensure the orchestration exists. The request type is the transaction identifier passed to the orchestration. This is useful when multiple filter records need to be called, need to call the same orchestration allowing a single common orchestration to respond to specific logic or target requirements. And how to make the call. For example, the orchestration may need to be called immediately in line with the current process, or perhaps immediately but separately via batch call, or it may need to be queued, ready for a sweeper process to pick up at a later stage. This last option is very useful for chatty integrations. Inventory mo movements are a good example where you may want to gather the changes for the last five or 10 minutes and send them as a single payload, potentially reducing the transactions from hundreds of calls to a single call, greatly lowering the noise. The important thing to understand here is that this record, this dynamic filter record, will be used by the process to instigate the integration at an event or transaction level, meaning that at the point the JD event occurs, if the filter criteria is met, this process will call the orchestration specified, identifying the transaction via the request type and calling it as per the method selected. It is all based on what is entered here. In the summary, the Fusion 5 dynamic filtering pivots creation and maintenance of the filters from being primarily code to being primarily configuration. Significantly, it also brings these tasks within the domain of appropriate business or systems users, reducing or eliminating the need for technical involvement. The role of the filter itself becomes central to controlling and defining integrations. Naturally, it performs the task of determining if an integration will run based on sophisticated client-defined defined filtering mechanisms but it also determines what integration will run in the scenario specified by the filtering, as well as at defining how that integration will run. The dynamic filtering enables purely through configuration, a single JDE event to lead to the initiation of multiple integrations. 
So when using dynamic filters, if a new use case arises for an existing integration, perhaps a new target system, or, or maybe the target system now needs to be updated when a PIC confirm is completed. This can be done just by adding a filter record. And this all works with link to and extends the Fusion Thrive integration framework. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, it's, um, you know, as I see more and more people touching into this world, uh, you know, it, you know, it just amazes me what can be done. And um, particularly, you know, that mindset we spoke earlier about, you know, the moving to vanilla um, and where you can re remove your need for code um, and remove your need for, you know, even in some of those is coming to us. Um, you know, down the track for development support and things like that. Um, so thanks, Justin. Um, you know, continuing along um, with our trends, um, you know, I've now got our consulting manager, uh, Shri. Uh, I think nearly everyone um, has dealt or deals with Shri, um, uh, you know, with any delivery engagements that you have through the organisation. But, you know, Shri is also um, a long time consultant from our ranks. Um, and she's going to talk to you about, you know, the continuous improvement, continuous delivery um, journeys that people can take. Thanks, Andrew. A very good morning to all. Um, as the theme for today's town hall is, uh, you know, top five from Fusion 5, um, I would like to really talk about one of the key services that we have provided um, this year to our customers. We started on this a couple of years back and have been continuously improvising on the way we do things. Um, so I'm going to talk about continuous improvement. Just a bit of a background of how this came about and how this all started. Um, if, if you all have been sort of with JD for a few years and you know have experienced um, um, a JD upgrade uh, in your JD journey, uh, I'm sure you would have all uh, experienced these um, challenges that I've listed on the screen. So typically customers would take up a JD upgrade, let's say once in four or five years, some um, you know even more than that. And uh, typically upgrades have always been these massive complex projects, you know, which required a big team, um, uh, for the project uh, required a significant amount of time from you know the developers to uh, retrofit all the customizations that you have for your site it required a significant uh, investment as well like capex for your new infrastructure uh, the project budget itself uh, if any of the peripheral systems needed uh, upgrades and updates along with jde uh, and all this in turn essentially meant a significant disruption for the business as well because you had to involve the business for various stages of throughout the stages of the project and and many of these ended up being just you know like for like technical upgrades where the business did not really see any value in these technical upgrades um, things didn't really change much for them and and considering all these challenges with upgrading jd obviously oracle um you know, then came up with a new way of releasing changes or enhancements. Um, so they call it continuous adoption or continuous delivery, where instead of releasing major upgrades, you know, once every few years, the updates are now small, incremental, more frequent, and easier to consume. Um, that this new way of doing things is meant to give the customers more control over how they maintain JDE and how they benefit more from uh, using JDE. But but when this all came up a couple of years back, we also realized the need that there needs to be some structure and process and a framework around these continuous updates. Because um, if not, the customers may end up again being in the same situation of you know taking on a big massive upgrade once in every four or five um, years or so. Um, and, and that's how continuous improvement program came about. So what, what is really this program? Um, this is basically a service offering from Fusion 5 where we keep, uh, we help you to keep your JD systems updated. And when we say JD, it's not just uh, the JD application in itself, but essentially the full stack um, of JDE right from your infrastructure to operating systems, databases, web logic, Java, and everything else that comes with JDE. Now, Keeping your JD current and updated means that you are also maintaining the technical certifications that are outlined by Oracle. Uh, you no longer have outdated operating systems which are out of support, um, where no fixes are being released, uh, but you are actually uh, you know, mitigating that risk when it comes to outdated um, 
platforms. This also, um, as I said, uh, helps you mitigate the security risks or vulnerabilities because you are continuously you know, updating your systems, you're, you're keeping up with the technology trends. Um, and the other, um, so, so this is the technology part of it, but, but we wanted to make this in, uh, in such a way that the business actually sees the benefit from doing this. And that's why if you see um, in the picture there, we start with the technology update and the application update, make sure everything is uh, current. And then we, uh, uh, we help you to reduce your technical debt. So we'll come in there and we'll help you analyze all the customizations that you have, uh, see what can be replaced with standard features in JDE, um, or if you could replace actually, um, like Justin mentioned, um, replace code level changes by configurations and thus reduce your technical debt. Um, this only helps you um, in making, in consuming these updates, um, you know, easier and, um, uh, you know time to value when it comes to doing these updates essentially we then move on to um, uh, something called as maturity model assessments and uh, venice has already spoken about it so i won't go into details there but here uh, we come in and help the business uh, get the most out of these updates and from maturity model assessments what results is basically business process improvements and then we go on um, on the cyclic um, journey of you know um, continually uh, doing this on a year on a year basis. Uh, so that's what continuous improvement program is about. I will quickly touch base on the components that we cover as part of um, continuous updates when it comes to technology. Um, so obviously the first and foremost is JDE. Um, uh, when we say JDE, it basically means the application and the tools levels for JDE. Um, so as part of continuous improvement program, we recommend annual updates of your JD application and tools versions. Uh, the recommendation is to go for the latest uh, major application release that is available. Um, for example, it is UN7 at this point. Uh, UN8 will be released uh, very soon, I guess in a few weeks time. And with tools releases, we recommend uh, going with the latest tools release that is available. So it's 9274 or 928, which, which is again expected to come out very soon. Um, so that's an annual update of JDE. That is once every year. Next uh, component is WebLogic and Java. Now, as you all may know, um, Oracle typically releases uh, security patches for WebLogic every quarter. Um, so we recommend applying these patches as soon as they come out and uh, that is embedded in the in the program uh, that is quarterly patching of Java and WebLogic. Uh, next up is operating systems and databases. Um, we carry out monthly patching for um, these two components. Um, so again, there is a predefined um, yearly schedule. So right at the beginning of the year, you will know exactly what is going to come up um, and at what time. Um, you will know exactly when the patching windows will be uh, scheduled and what is the expectation from the business in terms of downtime. Um, that's operating system and database. And um, outside of these uh, scheduled activities throughout the year, obviously there's an ongoing um, check in the back end, which in the form of our health checks and monitoring. So health checks, again, uh, it, it, is, it, it depends completely on what the business requires or what is um, your need, whether you need monthly health checks, quarterly, half yearly or yearly. It's completely flexible. Monitoring, under monitoring, we, um, uh, we provide 24 by 7 monitoring of your JD, um, entire JD landscape and, and the monitoring happens um, at the resource level, that is your hardware or moving on to you know how many uh, if there are any bad jobs that are long running or any queues are held uh, if any instance is down any server is down um, all these events are monitored and then alerts get sent to an app um, and from the app um, um, calls and notifications go out to our uh, fast response teams who then jump into and uh, help you resolve these incidents on an immediate basis um, so that's that's uh, the whole structure of uh, continuous updates. And uh, just to note here that we, we recommend a platform uplift once in every three years. Um, so these these agreements are typically uh, three-year contracts where uh, we, we conduct um, a complete platform uplift that is upgrade of operating system and databases uh, once in every three years. So that's the continuous update part of it. 
Um, now I'm sure that many other vendors are doing something similar on these lines because that is the need of the hour. But I do feel that Fusion 5 is unique in the way we are doing certain things um, when it comes to, comes to continuous improvement. Um, we uh, we manage it for you. So we provide it as a managed service. Um, we take care of, like I said, the yearly schedules. Um, uh, we cover the full stack. Um, also, we've, we've tried to sort of convert that, you know, CapEx um, uh, expenditure for you into something as an operational expense. So there will be a monthly fixed fee that you uh, pay. You don't have to have a big budget for an upgrade uh, going forward anymore. We also have dedicated teams, uh, which we call as uh, CI squads. These are basically consultants and teams dedicated to doing just continuous updates for, for our customers. They roll, they keep rolling on from one update to another. What this helps is with, you know, actually gaining knowledge and learnings from one update and carrying it forward to the future ones. And not just that, not only does this help our team to, you know, uh, gain knowledge about your site and use that with every update, we also use knowledge from the other um, rollouts that we do for other customers because because essentially the, the updates that we apply are the same for everyone and any known bugs, known issues, uh, they're always um, identified beforehand and always um, help us um, down the line. So that's CI squads, which is I think different. We also have a framework around this. So that is we have um, uh, defined, well-defined tools and templates um for for every aspect of the update uh, be it right from you know impact analysis of what the update is going to you know do for you um then the testing scope the retrofit scope and right till the end where you go live with the update be it your cutover run sheets or uh, all other project management related templates uh, we do edge i do i do want to highlight here that we do um, use cutting edge technology uh, with our IP, ERP insights, um, and things like Google BigQuery and Luca Studio to actually give you exact analysis of uh, the impact. I'm going to show a couple of quick screenshots here. Um, so this is just a sample um, report that we provide when it comes to impact analysis. So if you can see uh, here, what it basically shows you is update UN7 um, affects different objects, obviously, across system codes. So this report gives you a clear breakdown of uh, the impact by object type as well as system codes. And um, very quickly, it will tell you what you need to worry about and what you, sh what you need not. Um, so if you look at the applications part of it, this says roughly, you know, a thousand objects, a thousand applications are impacted by UN7. But we go to the next level and see how many of these are you actually using? Maybe you are just using um, a very small portion of these applications, which is 65 in this case. Um, so you, you need not really worry about uh, 900 other applications that are getting changed with this update because you don't use it. And so that really brings down the testing scope significantly uh, for you and reduces the timeline of this update as well. And, and the next level to this is, okay, how many of these are really modified at your side? So if they are modified, then they need retrofit, but if they are not, then you just have to test it and check them off. So uh, these reports, um, I think, significantly reduce the duration of the entire process and makes it very easy for the customers to take this on. And um, finally, um, time to value cycles, as I mentioned before, uh, Post this technology update, obviously we move on to things like business process improvements, which I've spoken about. I know Vanessa has touched upon this, but a lot comes out of um, this um, in terms of your usage of user-defined objects, be it simplification, automation of processes, or just using standard features in JDE. Um, so I think um, I think it is going to, more and more customers are going to uh, be requiring this um, continuous adoption, continuous improvement sort of a program to get the most on their ROI. And um, I think Fusion 5 can really help you here. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat or um, you can um, connect with us separately as well. And we are, uh, will be more than happy to talk further on this. Thanks, Andrew. That's all for me. Awesome. Thanks, Shrey. Um, and just on that, you know, I personally have multiple customers doing this. I've got one customer that's now in their third iteration um, of uh, annual update. Um, and these customers, from an account management perspective, from my side and also from their side, 
when they just have clarity about what's going on, they have their budgets locked in, they know what's happening for the next three years. And the big thing that we're finding is the business users now have a schedule. Um, so once we do the first update, if that date works for the customer, that then becomes their date uh, for their go live. So then they know that, um, you know, they've got this two week window once a year where they have to come in and do some basic testing of the solution so you know just being able to put that in place um it makes life easier for for everyone and um, you know particularly you know if you think to the standard things which are the rocks with upgrades and updates um you know testing is always one that everyone has to deal with okay so last one we've got in the session is oh sorry second to last sorry um jumping ahead of myself here um just want to bring in one of our leads um, from a functional perspective. Um, you know, Struan is doing a lot now working on the data side um, and experiencing a lot in that space. Um, but just wanted to talk about, get him on board to talk about what you can do with something that may, people may not have heard of, um, but I'm hoping some people have heard of, is regards to, uh, you know, jet apps. Sorry, let's just figure this out. Okay. Um, yeah, so what are uh, Jet Apps? So Jet Apps provide functionality to build charts with JDE data. So um, these are built directly in JDE. Uh, and when we combine this with E1 Pages, we've got the ability to create dashboards natively in JDE. So these dashboards provide users with an insight to data that matters to them. Uh, the advantage is that it, uh, we can present data in a single uh, location on a single page. So for example, JDE data that historically would have needed to be drilled through um, through a number of um, applications to see can be placed together in a single view um, graphically. Um, I'll get into some detailed examples soon, but uh, one use case for this might be looking at information say in a work order, where work orders are being placed and hold due to um, inventory items being out of stock. Now, traditionally, you'd need to first analyze why these orders on hold and then drill through a number of screens to end up getting, um, finding out, you know, this is out of stock and how you're gonna handle it. Um, we can now present all that information in a single page. Uh, we can highlight where these are out of stock and users can action these um, directly, well, not directly from the page, but they can get to the pages to action these directly from, um, from the Jet app. Okay, so. I'll talk a bit about the features of Jet Apps and then we'll get into some um, concrete examples. Okay, the, um, so the ability to create charts, uh, not only uh, so all kinds of charts, you know, line charts, bar charts, um, but also we can deliver um, data in, in a tabular format. We've also got the ability to have a traffic lighting system. So we can, uh, based on variables, we can highlight uh, data in, in, in these charts. Uh, we've got the opportunity to use filters, so both interactive filters as well as um, system-wide filters. So, for example, you might, as you log on, uh, your Jet app will use your user um, identification or your user ID to um, filter that data. So, only showing data that is applicable for a particular user. Um, there's the ability to do calculations, so both we can we can aggregate data, but then there's also the ability to use data that um, is in, a JD, in these JDE queries, and then we can do calculations um, between that. Um, there's the ability to click through to an application. So directly from the Jet app, we can click on the graph or on some data in, in the table format, and we can uh, launch a JDE application in the background uh, and carry those filters through too. So as an example, if you, um, are looking at a subset of data in a graph, you know, 30% of my orders uh, fall into a certain category. You click on the graph, it can carry that categorization through to the um, QBE in the JDE application and filter that data immediately. So it, it not only presents the data nicely in the first instance, but it can also, when you're clicking through and, and access the application to action that, uh, it's already doing some of that pre-filtering for you. Um, it also has hover overs where um, in the graph you can hover over the data and it provides some more information. And then the um, some customization. So not only is the ability to customize these um, graphs uh, quite extensive, you know, you can do quite a bit with it, but it's also will work with your JDE customized applications and customized data. So if you've got any um, data in, you know, system 55, 56, 57, 
um, that it works exactly the same. You know, it's completely integrated into JDE. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a bit about that integration now. So how it's achieved is it's using JDE queries at the heart of the data. So those queries can either be based on JDE tables, it can be based on the business views, or it can be based on the applications. And again, another advantage of that is the security. So you know, many reporting systems or dashboarding systems, you have to um, replicate the logic of security in order to ensure that um, it's being maintained across systems. Yeah, because it's working on the JDE query, the security is integrated. So any row security or column security you have in place, and even application security, that applies to the JET application too. So um, because the query runs in JDE, uh, it, it'll only return data that, that people have access to. Another nice thing about the JET apps is it's delivered through the one pages, so you have the native JDE navigation. Um, there, there's nothing there new for, for users to learn. So I'll, I'll look, uh, sorry, I'll look at a, okay, first some limitations and considerations, I guess. Um, because it's JDE queries, large data sets um, can be an issue. Uh, just like in JDE grids, where you know you, you get into an application and a grid returns the first 20 or 50 rows, uh, and then if you expand that out, it can take a bit of time. Large data sets can um, also, you know, queries based on, on large data sets are going to take a while to return. The way that I think about it, though, for dashboards is you generally want to be working with data that's current and relevant for a user. So you don't really want to be using it as a reporting tool and, and trying to query data from, from a couple of years ago. Um, and screen space falls into that same category. You know, it, it, dashboards work well where we are dealing with um, a handful of, uh, as an example, if you're looking at, at sales orders, you might only want to be looking at, you know, your top 10 or you know the, the, the last month's worth of data. When, when you're returning huge um, numbers, the, 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 the Graphs become crowded. The, um, the labels uh, overlap, so, so you really don't want to be doing that. Okay, so this is a dashboard we've built um, for a customer, and this is actually three individual Jet apps here. Each of these graphs uh, and the table at the bottom are their own Jet application. It's, um, we've combined them using E1 Pages to, to create a dashboard-like um, presentation, and um, so, so yeah, what uh, these um, are representing, you've got you know top 10 purchase orders. So it, it's a contract summary. Um, so top 10 purchase orders for this particular user, um, some open purchase orders based on a contract. Uh, and in this um, instance here, we have a dynamic filter. So um, it's showing that for that particular contract, they have the drop down option where um, they can drop down and change that to, to another contract. And then we have a, um, a summary by con um, contract summary by, by owner. So this is um, a nice example. I just click on. Okay. Um, so that was the op um, as I mentioned before. You have uh, this option to pop out. So on that dashboard, you can then click on on this particular table. It explodes it. So the uh, user has more um, real estate, screen real estate, to view the data. Um, it brings up that table format and the um, a couple of the, the, I guess, the features of Jet application that we have at work here. Uh, the traffic lighting, so the, the contracts. Um, in this particular one, it is uh, keying off a, the completion dates where contracts are are not expiring within the next three months. They're, they're labeled green. Ones that are, are coming close to expiration are the yellow colors. And then if they, they pass expiry and you still have open amounts on them, they, they've, they've turned red. Um, another feature I have going on here is, is the calculations. So both the um, the open amount and contract amount calculations are aggregations from the purchase order screen, and then the percentage spent is a, a calculation, uh, you know, between what's already spent and, and the contract amount. So those are, are calculations that don't need to be um, available in the business views from JDE. Um, they built completely within the application, and. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so the next uh, thing to talk about, I guess, is click-throughs. So in this particular instance, uh, the user has the opportunity, they might look at this red contract and go, what's going on here? They can click on that and it'll take them through to a particular JD application. That's The choice of that application is customizable. Um, so it, it's really just the link uh, that, that they click on. They um, And we can carry through, in this example, the contract number um, that will pre-populate it in the QBE. 
and then just show the JDE screen uh, with the, the filtered data, the users you know, can then immediately interact with that data. So from this screen, which is presenting, um, I, I guess, the summarized view of, of what they might want to be dealing with in the day, they can get right down to the detail with one click. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, as a bar chart, a, a couple of the features we've got um, going on here is, is the hover over. So if you move up to the, to the bar, it, it's then uh, the hover over, it'll pop up there some additional information. And once again, you can click on that, it, it can take you through to um, a predefined JDE screen that, that, that somebody can action. Um, okay, so I guess, yeah, just in summary, uh, Really, what the JET applications, the, the benefits they provide is you're providing a, a, a um, quite a bit of JDE data in a single view. So um, traditionally, where that may have been um, separated over a number of JDE screens, you can consolidate that in, in a single view. You can highlight that data based on, on variables. Um, you can filter it so that you, you're only showing a subset of that data that, that is applicable to a person's job. And then from that, they, they can easily access that data and uh, action it in, in JDE itself without having to switch between systems. In, a, in traditional dashboards, you may have had to um, copy the purchase order number from another um, screen, come into a different browser window um, in JDE, move to the correct application, you know, paste it in. That can all be done with a single click. So yeah, I hope I've just given you a bit of background, a, a new way to think about how you can interact with the data. Um, you know, these things would be specific to to an environment, you know, and, and to a use case. So yeah, I hope I've just given you some food for thought. Thanks very much. Awesome, thanks, Sean. And yeah, um, you know, just the in talking to customers uh, across you know Australia and around the world that visibility of data and how they can interact with data um, is making a massive difference to organisations utilising JDE. Okay, so yeah, we're now to the last presentation uh, and um, I would like to finish off by introducing, I don't think the man needs any introduction, but he is our Director of JDE Woods and Innovation, um, Shannon Moyer. Fantastic, thanks Andrew. Um, and thanks to all the presenters so far. I've been learning things and writing a bunch of questions down, but I won't bore everyone with my questions. I'm just trying to flick on over to the next slide here. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was um, what customers have been asking me for over the the last year. And um, I think you've heard quite a few, you know, customer obsessed stories, I would like to say. I think you're, you've heard from our um, previous four panelists about um, what we've been doing to help customers get more out of JD Edwards, what we've been doing to visualize data better, what we've been doing um, to stay up to date more efficiently. So they, all of what you've heard about are based upon our customers' needs and what we've implemented in the last year. And I just wanted to explain some of the um, conundrums that my customers have come up with and they've needed help with in terms of, again, visualizing data. I think there's a, there's a theme amongst um, the presenters so far. It's about um, the visualization of data has been important, especially with um, what we saw from Jet Apps. And I'm going to um, go through these questions and how we visualize this data and answer these questions, which have been traditionally quite difficult. Um, so the first one I'm going to go through is a customers quite often asking, um, where can I put my UDOs and, and measure the impact? So they, they want want to understand bang for buck the best place to put a user-defined object in JD Edwards um, so that they get ROI on that configuration not code and remember there's this huge theme of enterprise automation which I'm going to address in, in my subsequent slides but, but knowing where to put these investments is critical we also think um, another question I'm asked often is how do I know what programs I'm using? Um, that knowing the programs that you're using is going to that's fantastic information if we're running a maturity model. And we heard from Vanessa how we run our maturity models, and this is a critical critical piece of granular information. We know exactly what programs you're using, so we can recommend other programs that may be beneficial in some of your processes. 
another question that I get asked often is how can I tell if I need more JD Woods licenses? The last thing we want is Oracle knocking on the door and saying, hey, you're under licensed and can you back pay these modules? So what we do is we can give you a live dashboard to understand how many um, licenses you've used in the last week, month, year for all of the JD Edwards modules and make sure that you're right sized. And then finally, um, is my JD Edwards performance normal? Um, we don't want users sitting around waiting for a screen to load if they don't have to. And JD Edwards is traditionally a performant um, web application. Most of my clients are getting sub-second response times for every single page that they're loading in their ERP. We have that information, we measure that information, and we can make recommendations to ensure that people aren't sitting around waiting for their screens to refresh. So I just want to go through these dashboards and, and I guess underpinning all of this, you know, if you want to make better decisions, you need better data and we'll be showing you some better data, I hope. So what I've got here is um, uh, where can I put my UDOs and measure the impact? I'm going to I'm going to answer a little bit of this on the on the next slide. But what you see here is a dashboard that we've created about the UDO maturity at a particular organisation. And what we what we've got here is we can see the types of user defined objects that they've created in the organisation. We can see the system codes where those um, UDOs have been created, and we can see the path codes where those UDOs have been created and when we look at that information we can understand which which system codes are using who is trained appropriately to implement user-defined objects and then we might be able to focus our training on other particular areas where we want to improve um, user productivity and make the most out of um, configuration not code so um, I, I guess Im improvements to um, our JD was usage without inheriting technical debt. The other really nice view you've got here, and it, it scrolls across here, is this is the daily um, UDO uh, increases. or the, the, So this is the user community and what sort of UDOs they're creating on a daily basis. And this is fantastic information too, because if you do some training about how to create user-defined objects, we can see the impact of the training immediately and we can measure the impact on a system code by system code basis to ensure we have the right people in the room when we do our next amount of training or whether we're resonating when we perform our training. Another um, uh, another screen I wanted to show you here is, well, where, where do I put those UDOs? You, you want to understand what the important applications for your organisation are um, so that you can decide, I'm going to put effort into UDOs into particular applications. And so what we see here is some demonstration data and a dashboard that's updated 24 by 7 about the actual usage of JD Edwards at this particular organisation. And so we can see how many users have logged in in the defined time period. We have a pull down where we pull down the defined time period, but we see in this two week period, we've had 158 unique users, which is pretty standard for this organisation because we can see that it, uh, that's actually decreased 14% um, for the previous two weeks, which isn't, that's interesting in itself. We can see that we've used 243 unique applications and there's been about 30,000 interactions with JD Edwards in that period of time. And then we look at which applications are generating the most um, interactions. And, and so we can look at this data by the amount of time people spend on a screen, or we can look at the amount of interactions they've had on particular screens. And guess what? When people are using a screen a lot, that's the perfect candidate for maybe some process improvement, may, maybe implementing some UDOs, maybe that's what we focus on when we're doing our maturity models. And then also, that's probably what we're going to be doing our testing and training on in our continuous improvements. You can see how we use this information for all of the previous speakers on this call. It's critical to be able to measure um, what's going on and then also quantify any improvements. You also see here that we can look at that data by system code, we can look at the data by region, and we can look at that data by hour, month, year. So we get a fantastic understanding of exactly what's going on in an organisation. We, we're measuring those um, unique signals which allow us to fine-tune process improvement. 
Uh, another scenario that I get asked from customers often is that they want to understand that their JD was licensing metrics uh, 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 w within scope. I'm sorry the writing's a little bit small, but I'll tell you the, the ideals of this report. It's because we're measuring every interaction by every user in every environment for JD Edwards. We understand the um, applications that they're going into and performing actions in JDE. That gives us the perfect place to generate a license usage model. So what we do is we use your agreement from Oracle, we can load it up into the cloud and we can record how many people you're licensed for, for the individual JD Edwards modules and whether you have a license for them. And we can compare that with actual usage in your organization. Now this is really important because if there's ever, a, um, if you're using too many licenses in particular areas like procurement, and you may be surprised, it's the system code it's the SYR, it's the, the, it's the system reporting code that's critical to, that defines what um, license you need to run a particular program in JD Edwards. And so this extracts all of the data, it understands exactly what modules you're licensed for and what you're using, and then we can use that to understand whether you're under or over. The other really nice thing you can do with that information is if you're over, you can look at the programs and the users that are using that particular module and it sometimes it turns out to be one simple program and and then you can change a process or you can change your processing option to not use that additional problem therefore not use that additional module and guess what um, with with software configuration you're um, you're no longer um, ha have an audit problem where you no longer have a license problem in JD Edwards and so we've helped out a bunch of clients that way to ensure that their their licensing bomb is right sized for their organization the final um, question I um, get asked by my customers all the time is, is my JD Edwards performance normal? Um, and I've got two dimensions in which we measure the JD Edwards performance for an organization. The first one I'm showing you here is um, we measure page download time, we measure server response time, and we, we measure um, the actual browser rendering time for all JD Edwards interactions that occur. And, and that gives us an amazing, um, that gives us amazing historical view of what's going on for an organization's performance. We also know, you know, generically w what you should be able to achieve with JD Edwards and therefore not let you sit on a 1.6 second um, average page um, load time. We can get you back to under one um, because that's an expectation that, that many of our clients um, is met, whether they're cloud, whether they're on-prem, you can get to under a second for all your page loads. You can see there that this is great for historical reasons, so if you were to change your network topology or if you were to change your internet connection, etc., cetera, um, you will see the differences in these metrics. And you can look at the performance for um, North America, for example, as that compares to Australia and as that compares to wherever people are using JD Edwards in your organization. Um, we also can determine the performance of different browsers and we understand the usage and um, release levels of particular browsers and that's sometimes really interesting information for your desktop team to make sure that that SOE is being deployed uh, appropriately throughout the organization. The second um, image I want to show you here is what we can do with um, batch performance and that is the purest measure of performance for JD Edwards because you're only dealing with generally two tier or single tier architecture where your batch engine and your batch logic is right next to the database server and has zero latency for that. So any changes to your database technology, your batch processing, um, CPU topology will be um, will make a material difference in your runtime. And what you often don't what you often don't measure is that that long term trend. To know that in January a job on average took 30 minutes, but in December it's taking 90 minutes. But because it's so iterative, because you see it every day, you don't really worry about it. But our reporting here highlights those sort of problems, allows you to see where you've got these long term trending issues, and that again we go into recommendations of purging or recommendations to reduce the data set so the jobs have consistent run times in your organization. We can also evaluate queuing times and rows process and all sorts of other um, data. 
But this particular screen shows you a month's UBE usage and summarizes the performance difference from to the previous month in a single screen for every single job that you've run in JD Edwards. So it shows you average runtime and how that compares to the previous month in a single screen. So you can imagine for uh, you, you, you know your technical representatives or even your business people, if that got sent to you on a monthly basis, you could have a quick look at that report and you'd understand exactly where your performance is at for JD Edwards and how it compares with the previous month. Just jumping to the next screen, and um, apologies for everyone, but I'm doing also the in focus updates. I've got two, two, so I won't get Andrew to um, introduce me for the next section. I think I can take this one on. So I was just going to give you a little bit of an update about um, in focus. So I was fortunate enough to attend in focus. Um, w with Glenn Mansfield earlier this year. I, I think it's nice to talk about some of the high level numbers. We still have over 4,000 JD Edwards customers um, paying maintenance to Oracle. Uh, um, so that that is a really large user community. Uh, I think there's about 600, 600 in attendance at the InFocus event. But some of the other statistics you'll see here shows a vibrant community and an energized community around um, JD Edwards. And, and so there's been 575 learned JD updates, you will find that I've got some really cool QR codes to get your phones ready for some sites that you can go to to, to, to get right to the information that was um, put out at um, this particular event. Um, some of the other exciting ones I thought here is that we have over 311 live JD Edwards clients on OCI. So that's the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Cloud. And then uh, another 400 that have some sort level of hybrid cloud. And so if you add those two numbers together, that's 20% of the people that are paying, the customers paying maintenance are on some sort of cloud architecture. And I will say um, from the customers that I speak to, um, eight or nine out of 10 upgrades that we do or transformation projects that we do for our customers involve a move to the cloud. So it's a really exciting place to be and JD Edwards sits really well in the cloud. I think one other important metric here is there's been um, more than 80 people do a full financial transformation to um, Oracle ERP Cloud. So th that's a really interesting statistic going forward as well. And sort of th that was something that was addressed at, at InFocus. Okay. Um, oh, now I've gone too far. It's, you're not supposed to. Oh, now I've gone very far. I'm just going to go back a few slides here. Sorry, the, um, um, it's a bit laggy at my end. I don't know what it's like for you, but this is um, so this is a slide I wanted to talk to here. Um, so as I said, there was over 600 attendees. Um, it, it's a fantastic JD Edwards Focus community event. There are hundreds of different um, education sessions. Um, we go there to learn about all the new enhancements. We go there to be able to tell our customers and tell our consultants, hey, this is coming. This is what Release 24 is going to include. Watch these updates. And so, again, when we talk about continuous improvement, when we talk about maturity models, you know that we're coming to your businesses with all the latest information and we're not going to create technical debt for your JD Woods instance because we understand the roadmap, we understand what's coming and, and we know that, hey, we can implement this change without changing your code set, which is really important. Um, so many of the sessions, more than 40% of the sessions were about Orchestration Studio. And you saw that you heard the authority that Justin spoke um, with in his presentation um, on um, the event tracking in JD Edwards and, and putting rules, a rules engine around that. And um, he also has developed the orchestration framework and, and cr just a critical component if you want to put belt and braces on your integrations in JDE using Orchestration Studio and someone that, um, you know, is really passionate about the technology as well. So we always learn heaps, and but what I will say, Australia and New Zealand are shining for, for the customers that I get involved with, the projects I get involved with, um, we are doing some really um, bleeding edge stuff and it's fantastic. We should all be proud of the um, the, the way we're using JD Woods and the latest tools um, to get the most out of the platform. 
I think another really important thing is release 24 is coming. We know we're thinking one or two weeks we'll get a we'll get an announcement soon, and and I think the energy's lifting. If you follow any of the JD Edwards um, leaders leadership team on LinkedIn, they're starting to talk more and more about release 24. We had some fantastic opportunities to talk to the experts, to talk to the people that write the code, to talk to the people that uh, you know visual envision what the code's going to do going forward, and that was fantastic as well. And and then I think. Finally, I, I think the two themes that were really clear, and and I think it 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 really does distill down to us as a community and us as JD was customers and JD was consultants. It's the adoption of AI and and how we can um, get the most out of our AI with our JD Edwards um, platforms. And then the second thing was enterprise automation. Like they were the really key themes I took away from the presentations. Just going to attempt to move forward here. Okay, um, so I'm not going to play this video. Oh, oh, jeepers. Sorry. I I'm not going to play this video, um, but you can just take a snap of that. It's a really good video, release 24, about release 24 and some of the technical and functional improvements that are going to be put into that. I'm going to gloss over some of these, but um, uh, just a really good little piece of PR about release 24 and, and what to expect next. Again, um, that this is a roadmap video and uh, I think you got a safe harbour statement around that. Um, my next screen here is uh, I can only emphasize how good uh, Learn JDE is. We saw that there's 575 updates that have been put into that web page I think in, in since 2020. So it's updating all the time. The content is fresh and if you ever if you have a role in an organization and you can you can go to this page and again you can scan that code. It takes you directly to Learn JDE. It's unauthenticated and you get to see the June 2023 drop of code and the application enhancements under financials, procurement, transportation management, etc. And you get to see the tools enhancements that were dropped into the tools release and into the application release as at June 2023. And what we're going to see is when update 24 gets released, we're going to have a lot more boxes across the screen here. We, we can drill down into a serious amount of um, functional and technical enhancements that have gone into the platform. And so we're all looking out for that. Again, they give you a high level summary like I've listed below on this screenshot. So you can see what's in the financials June 2023 release, for example, and, and you can look and say, oh, that's something that we want to implement uh, uh, in terms of maturity models, in terms of process improvement, in terms of continuous improvement. I will touch on one thing, and it just reiterates what Sri was saying, is quite often we take all these updates, but we don't consider the impact to our end users. And that's where we really, want, and Fusion 5 do focus on the the improvements in the platform and, and our maturity model exercises extract that in a, in a really um, prescriptive way so that you know what you can do to improve your use of these modules. So, so it's not just a technical upgrade, it's not just technical compliance, despite the fact that that's very important, it's actually extracting that um, to allow the business to make better decisions. Okay, so I'm just waiting for clarification on the next slide, here we go. And so uh, I wanted to, again, I, I sort of touched on these. Uh, this is a, this QR code will take you to this list of fun, uh, um, features and functions that are going to be released, or sorry, should be a plan to be released in and release 24. And what they all link to is an educational video. So it's just a short video, it's a snapshot, it's two to three minutes where you get to learn about um, the, the release component and what it means to end users. And I, I just wanted to, um, look at two ones in particular that I thought was really interesting. Now the AI and ML accelerator for JD Edwards, that really had me um, excited and I went and watched the video and what they've done is that they've used Oracle Cloud integration, so OCI has a connector for JD Edwards so it can plug in some of its generative AI models and some of its other AI models that are available to you that can be plugged in directly through JD Edwards. So um, 
and if you went to our kickoff or if you've seen some of our kickoff videos, you would have seen how Fusion 5 are doing exactly the same thing with OpenAI and ChatGPT and how we're integrating that functionality, to, let's say, into our batch engine. So we can upload a bunch of trial balance reports and say, we can ask ChatGPT from work submitted jobs, are there any anomalies in this data? And it goes and processes that with the generative AI model only using this private data that we've uploaded from uploaded from work submitted jobs and it can go and give you a response about that quite specific JD Edwards data so that's the cool exciting stuff that Fusion 5 are doing with AI and, and you can see that Oracle are also doing their Oracle branded AI integration and accelerations through OCI and their public cloud models as well so I thought that was really cool and it's and this is something that um, it, it's going to make a huge difference um, to all of our decision making going forward. The, the next one I thought was from a nerdy perspective, I thought this was pretty exciting. So what you're able to do, and functional people will like this because they don't have to talk to um, um, the CNC team to get a promotion done, but, but now in the web um, object management workbench, well in release 24, you will be able to promote um, uh, OMW based objects into a deployed package. So what that means is if you change the specs of a report or if you change the specs of a program, you can promote those directly from OMW into a deployed package in a runtime environment. So therefore no package build, no package deploy, the process of promotion is going to make that code available. So the next time that UBE runs without a, without a deploy, it's gonna pick up the new specs and run with those new specs. So I thought that was really cool. And again, we're seeing this efficiency come through um, with, the, with the cool um, enhancements in the base product. And then they're, they're two of many um, on this list that hopefully we'll see in release 24. Just jumping to the next screen. Again, I, I question myself whether I've pressed the button. Oh, right, so enterprise automation. It was the second thing I told you that, you know, those two key themes from InFocus um, that I got out of it was, um, you know, AI, integration of AI into JD Edwards, and we're gonna see that moving forward. Um, and then it was enterprise automation. And we have these steps of enterprise automation and it starts with ingest, um, then we model the process, we analyze the what the model that we've just created, um, we solve the problem and we measure the improvements. And I really think what you've seen from our, our previous four speakers is there's components of ingestion, there's components of modeling, there's components of analyzing. It's, it's using the signals from the application to find the right place to do enterprise automation. So, and it, Justin's presentation was excellent in terms of um, ingesting events from JD it was specific events that you want to then turn into some sort of enterprise automation process. Um, modeling, understanding what your end users are doing that at the, 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 from, um, from uh, cash, for, for order to cash, for example, you've got to understand what's being produced and, and you may have um, models created in your business about your, your process models that we, we're trying to automate. That's a really important part of, I think, um, making sure people understand what you're trying to achieve with your enterprise automation project. And that might be using BPNM standards and, and that's what our consultants try and use. Our consultants try and come in, they have a standard way of documenting a process in your business that you can implement enterprise automation around. Then we come in and we say, can that, can that be even more efficient? Because we don't just want to replicate what you're currently doing. We want to make it as efficient as possible in this enterprise automation. And that could be analysis of enhancements in JDE. Many things can contribute to the analysis component of enterprise automation. Um, then finally, we implement that. That could be using the workflow modeler in JD Edwards. It could be using orchestrations. It could be using your consistent middlewares. We don't mind. Just remember the ideals of um, putting the logic in your ERP. It's probably a better place to be than opposed to your your middleware layer or your integration layer. And then we run we run that automation. And again, you've seen hopefully with our with our ERP Insights um, product that you can measure the improvements. You can see less interaction from your Users. You can see less programs being used. You can see less time on screen, and hopefully they're um, using their time for more value-add processes. I think this could be the last of my screens. 
I'm going to see what's next. A bit cool. There we go. That's it. So look, thank you everyone. Ho hopefully uh, you've seen how we, fo um, what happened at In Focus, which was an excellent conference, first one in three years, first in-person conference in three years. And then hopefully you looked, you could see some of the signals that we use, these unique signals we use um, to keep your JD Edwards um, up to date and to recognise opportunities for efficiency. So um, thanks everyone. Bye. Oh, awesome. No, and um, you know, I am conscious of time, so I'm just going to get the team to jump on um, and turn their turn all their cameras on, and I'm just going to look and see what um, questions we've got um, to go through. So the first one might go out to maybe um, Justin and Shannon. Um, what prerequisites are there to be available to use the dynamic filtering? Um, so Jay would like is there anything on JD would a release or anything like that? No, not really. Um, the the technology to build the filters, et cetera, that we need is available on earlier releases of the tool, but naturally you might be restricted in the functionality available in the orchestrations. Um, but it won't affect the dynamic filter. Okay, cool. And sort of the same trends and maybe just draw on. Um, is there licensing for Jet Apps because it's Oracle? It's not. Is it part of JD with licensing? I must say I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to need to talk to Glenn and come back. No, there's not. There's Shannon. The, yeah. So you don't need any additional licensing to use. It's a JavaScript extension framework, so you don't need additional licensing to implement that functionality. Are there any constraints around reusing their templates, though? So? Yes. So um, actually, JetUps altogether is not, but you don't want to go using um, some of the watch list programs, which some people attempted to do. So you've got to be cautious about which programs you're calling with your JetUps to, yeah. um, to you know, visualize the data. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, and the last one I've got, and then I just quickly open it if anyone else has any other questions, is um, and this is probably you to shout a link with insights. Um, I received an email about the GA4 um, for insights. Like, what does that mean to me? <laughs> Your technical team is looking after you. So, yes, uh, Universal Analytics was retired earlier th this year and we've um, refactored our code to be compliant with Google Analytics 4. It does require a repatching of your tools release. And if that hasn't occurred yet, we're monitoring all the customers that have done that. So if you're an analytics customer and you are getting emails like that, we can flick you over to GA4 efficiently and then you'll um, you actually get some more insights out of the new software. Okay, um, I'm going to quickly just unmute, give everyone the opportunity to unmute, um, just to see if there's any final questions. Um, otherwise, I'll just do a quick wrap up and talk about our special office and um, close today. Okay, so you've got to unmute if you need to. Otherwise, um, yeah, I'll just jump in just quickly to close out for you know today's session. Um, you know, just some key points, um, you know, we've spoken about, you know, Edwards continuous release, Shannon mentioned release 24 is coming very soon, like in the next couple of weeks, but at the same time, we as Fusion 5 are continuing to innovate with Chad Edwards. Um, and I'm hoping that people are able to see in today's session, you know, examples of where we've done these various things for customers. Um, maturity models provide clarity from business pain points to business benefits. Um, so um, they're valuable. I've got customers going through them at the moment. They'll choose one particular module, um, whether it's financials, procurement, manufacturing, just you know, whatever, and they'll start there and then go from there and expand out into the business. Um, with anything in here that we've talked about, um, we're always the mindset of with our customers finding one pain point. So what's current, is there a current pain point that we can focus on? Let's fix that with whatever's needed. So whether that's process improvement, enhancements and configuration, uh, introducing the, you know, some orchestration, automation, whatever it is, let's get one pain point fixed and then look at producing the journey off the back of that. Um, Shannon spoke about with insights, um, you know, that insight information and the analytics has helps everyone make better decisions. Um, 
you need better data. I use it all the time with my customers. I look at the insights for the customers that I have that are running it, which is nearly all of them, um, and, and use that information when I go to talk to them. Um, they then use that for various parts of their journey, um, whether it's um, implementing something new, just some updates, um, uh, whether or just some annual checkups, health checks, whatever it is. Um, with what Shannon spoke about, and also particularly Strawn, um, you know, it's you know increasing your trust in your data through dashboards. Um, Shree spoke to you about you know the continuous delivery and doing the updates. This is something that everyone can take on board once you've gone to 9.2, um, and it's something that you know every customer should think about. Um, and then I've done a repeat, but anyway. So next steps for everyone. Um, business process improvements, which is what this was really all about you know, with, with our top five. So spoke about it, identify a pain point, potential scenario for your company. Reach out to a Fusion 5 account manager or worst case myself. Um, if you don't know who that is, and I'll point you in the right direction. We will schedule a discovery call to look at what it is and what you're trying to do and what your pain point, and then we'll give you some recommendation options and a preferred journey and, and, and start working with you on this journey. Um, just quickly, Shannon spoke about it. Um, I know they're overseas, these events, but they um, Quest are offering um, virtual content. So if you cannot make these, because it is a big jump to get from A and Z across the ditch, um, over to US, you can go to the Quest and you can register for um, an online um, online access to the conferences. Um, so something that then you can give you the ability over, I think it's like a few weeks to then to look at the content and share the content in your side of your organization. So the next big one is Blueprint, which is May next year. Um, once again in Dallas and that sort of stuff. But I think the viable option for everyone in this region is to look at the online uh, content. All right. Um, our hot deal. All right. Um, adding with Shannon and Shree in regards to this, two things we spoke about today. One was the orchestration framework, the other one was maturity model. So normally, walk framework, 20%, two ways you can have it as perpetual or as a SaaS licensing. Um, so we're doing discounts on that over the next couple of weeks. Um, same with maturity model. So one reporting code. So you come in, it's focused on finance, it's focused on procurement, it's focused on infantry, it's focused on manufacturing whatever, one of them. They're the two deals that we have at the moment. Um, these are valid and valuable to all organisations. Orchestration is the way forward. Maturity models are here to help you do business process improvements and how you can particularly look at all the different bits and pieces we've spoken about today and everything else we've covered off this year. So any questions on that? Um, please let us know. Talk to your account manager. These deals are out there till the 17th of November. Um, last thing I spoke about was symposium. In your calendars, Wednesday the 24th of May 2024 will be our next symposium in person. Location two to be determined, but get it in your calendar just so you're, um, you know, once more details come out. Um, we had a great, it was great to be back in person. We had some amazing sessions. We, you know, really focus on that theme of that JD surround strategy and there was benefit to everyone. And it was great to have customers come across from New Zealand as well to join us for the event. Um, outside of that, that's it for today's session. Um, this is, yes, our final town hall for this year. Um, I just wanted to thank um, my, the presenters for today. So Sheree, Vanessa, Struan, Justin and Shannon. Um, these events wouldn't be possible. Um, we did have a few changes, but that's the joy of the Fusion 5 team. We can quickly swap in with other people from our team. Um, you know, that's the sort of team that we've been able to put together and that's the amazing resources you get when working with Fusion 5. Um, and finally, I just want to thank everyone for attending um, and their continued support, not just of working with Fusion 5, um, but you know, just supporting the JD application, you know, as everything sees, it is going forward. It is going in leaps and bounds. It's a solution that you can make the cent your centric ERP go and continue to do for a long time. Um, so um, I may have missed a couple of questions, um, but I will respond to people in regards to those if I've, if if there's anything out there. Otherwise. Um, 
please stay tuned. There'll be a recording of this. Um, we'll also mention um, about the about the deals, and there'll be some additional content will come out off the back of it. So, just wanted to thank you all for joining us. Um, and if I don't speak to people, you know, as we start wrapping up this year, um, I hope you finish off the year, the 2023, fantastic, and then jump into 2024. Um, that's it for me. Thank you, um, and um, that's all. Thank you all. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you.